Because I like to share facts on this show, not right-wing talking points. Joe Biden paid almost $4 million in, in federal income tax in 2000. That's exactly right. That's right, in 2017. Kamala Harris, over a half a million. Bernie Sanders, close to 400000 Elizabeth Warren, close to $300,000 in federal income tax in 2017. Donald Trump, $750. Mesmerizing to me. So the guy we have with us on the line right now, he is a Trump biographer and a great CNN contributor. His upcoming book, High Crimes, The Corruption, uh, Impeachment of Donald Trump, which is coming out, by the way, pretty soon, several weeks, October 20th. Very happy to have Michael D'Antonio joining us right now on the line. Michael, thanks for being here. How are you? I'm great. Good to be with you. Thanks, Michael. Uh, So I saw you last night uh, talking a little bit about this breaking news story that came out as far as Donald Trump and his tax returns. So I have to ask you, you've been you've been covering Donald Trump for a very long time. What was the first thing that entered your mind when you heard this story coming out by The New York Times? The very first thought I had was, at last, we have confirmation of everything that reporters in New York have known since the 1980s. You know, this this whole Trump myth of him being a great businessman and a multi-billionaire has depended on secrecy. Right, right. right. His corporations have all been privately held with no uh, filings with the SEC, except for the casinos that went bankrupt. You know, mm-hmm. whenever he's been held to account by a board of directors or shareholders, it's been proven Mm-hmm. that he didn't know what he was doing. So we all knew this, um, but we couldn't prove it. And I guess the president uh, made angry. I was going to use a different term. <laughs> Someone <laughs> he shouldn't have made angry. And uh, they went to the Times with all these documents. And the list of people who could have done this is miles long, because he's right. just hurt and insulted and abused so many folks over the years. So, Michael, let me ask you, what do you, and and I agree with what you're saying, what would you say to people on the right, including the president and his enablers, that would say, well, you know what, he just had a good tax return guy, you know, this isn't on Donald Trump, or, hey, you know, he's reported losses, he didn't do anything wrong, he didn't do anything illegal. What would be your response to that? Well, there are a few things. It's yet to be seen whether he did anything illegal. This audit that he's subject to now is over a $100 million tax bill that he, that the IRS believes that he owes, that the state of New York believes that he owes. And it is a crime to knowingly sign a false tax return, not a civil offense. So people go to jail for this. Right. And I think that the other thing that I would say is that if these things were all kosher, How is it that all these other rich folks actually pay taxes? That's very true. Whether you're Warren Buffett or uh, a realty trust, you know, I'm very familiar with the operation of a few big realty trusts worth billions of dollars, and they pay taxes. Right. No question. they They pay them because they reach the end of the line when it comes to uh, reasonable uh, depreciation and sure. reasonable expenses. If you're just so, joining us, I'm sorry, sorry, Michael. If, yep. you're just, if you're just joining us to speak with Michael D'Antonio, his upcoming book, High Crimes, The Corruption, Impunity, and Impeachment of Donald Trump comes out October 20th. Of course, you also know him as a CNN contributor. So, so Michael, there's, again, you know, this is going to be brought up in the debate tomorrow, right? We all know that. That's obvious. How do you think Joe Biden should go after Trump when it comes to this stuff? Because obviously Wallace is going to ask him about this. And you know what Donald Trump's response is going to be, right? It's going to be the same response he gave yesterday in the press conference. It's fake news. I went through this four years ago. Uh, So so how do you think Joe Biden should respond to that? Well, here's one easy answer. If it's fake news and you have the real stuff, release it. Right. And, And of course he won't release it. And then the next thing Biden would say even if this is all legal and you paid seven hundred and fifty dollars in taxes in twenty sixteen that is two weeks pay for the lowest recruit in the military one of those guys that you say is a sucker if they get killed right what do you say to all these families who understand that your patriotism stops at seven hundred and fifty dollars right i think there's a lot that can be done with this material you know, Michael, to the best of your knowledge, as President of the United States, how is Donald Trump generating income? Well, I think that he's getting a lot of money from 
people flocking to his hotels and to his buildings, 40 Wall Street down in uh, the business, the financial district of Manhattan now has a lot of new tenants, law firms, Microsoft, other companies that want to carry favor with him. But the problem is he's not generating income. The golf courses, he went on a spending spree when, after the uh, golf industry collapsed, he was betting on it coming back. It didn't come back. He faces hundreds of millions of dollars in debt, but it's going to come due in 2021 and 2022. So he's not making money. This is the big fallacy of Donald Trump as a billionaire. He's in deep trouble. I think he ran for president to raise his profile to change his brand so that he could get out out of the looming disaster that he faced and getting elected was probably the worst thing that could have happened to him financially michael you've covered donald trump for years so i and you know i'm guessing and i guess you would be guessing as well but you would know better than i who do you think he owes this money to i mean this is upwards of what we're talking about 400 million dollars around that vicinity who do you think he borrowed this money from michael well, some of it definitely came from Deutsche Bank, and Deutsche Bank itself got the money from investors in Russia. So you tell me what that says. Wow. You know, this is, this is a big, big story. This, this is going to take years to unravel. Uh, Donald Trump may be dead by the time we know all of it. That's sad. That's but sad is, if that's true. <laughs> it is darker and yeah. more uh, terrifying than people imagine. So, Michael, it was it was uh, Donald Trump's former attorney, Michael Cohen, who said something that I actually agree with. And he, and he was giving Donald Trump advice in an interview. And he said, if I'm Donald Trump, if I was still his legal counsel, I would tell him to step down right now as president and hope that Mike Pence can pardon him because Michael Cohen believes that eventually Trump is going to go to jail uh, after he leaves office. Do you agree with that? I think it would be a smart thing to do. Yeah. If he's not elected uh, this election day, he really should step down. He, he should cite his health like everybody. He wants to spend more time with his family. And he's going to ask Mike <clears throat> to pardon him, to pardon everyone in his family, and to pardon half the cabinet. Because this is also a cabinet full of grifters who have run scams that will be unraveled when the next president comes into office, and it's going to make Watergate look like a picnic. It's so much worse. Uh, But we've been trying to tell people this for years. There's just a mesmerizing thing. You know, a great con artist makes you commit to the con to the degree that your pride depends on it being true, and you'll never let go. So... Donald Trump paid the U.S. Treasury a million dollars in 2016 and $4.2 million in 2017. And that's, that's quoted in the New York Times article. Why did, he, why did he pay the U.S. Treasury that money? Well, he may have paid it. I think he made a pledge that certain revenues from the Trump Hotel in Washington and perhaps uh, another facility would go to the Treasury rather than to his own pocket. And this was a way to satisfy people who are saying, look, uh, this, these are emoluments that are coming into the Trump Hotel in Washington. You know, the Saudis at one point, I think, reserved almost all the rooms in the hotel. Yeah. So the, he's looked at this and said, I've got to do something symbolic to let people know that I'm aware of this and I'm taking care of it. But there are revenues from Turkey, there are revenues from the Philippines, from Brazil, these foreign operations, Panama is a great place for him, are very significant. Um, but again, the strange thing is it doesn't wipe out the red ink. Right. You know, I, right. I, I don't understand how a guy could run this many businesses into the ground, but he's managed to do it. Yeah, well, he, he certainly has. So, Michael, let's dive a little deeper into this. We, you, of course, you heard the story in this article, uh, the details of a $70,000 write-off for hairstyling, Ivanka Trump being paid as an employee working for the Trump Organization, which is, by the way, under investigation. It's, it's why Eric Trump is trying to plead the fifth. Talk a little bit about that, because this is serious. It's not just Donald Trump that's in trouble here. It's members of his family that could be in a lot of trouble as well, correct? It, correct, and it's not the first time. So there was a, a terrible scandal involving Trump Soho downtown in Manhattan, where 
they marketed, his kids marketed uh, units in this, what was essentially a, a condominium hotel, as being almost sold out. Now, this has legal ramifications. You can't tell potential buyers that the place is 90% sold, 95% sold, when it was really 40% sold. And they got away with it. Um, the same Manhattan DA that is chasing Trump now actually cut the deal with them that allowed them to not be prosecuted. Wow. So it's not the first time that the kids are left in this terrible position. But they were trained up to be mini mobsters themselves. You know, and make no mistake, this is how mob families operate. There's so many crimes that you can't keep track of them all. Steve Bannon called it flooding the zone. You right. flood the zone and, you, and you, you tell so many lies, you operate so many frauds that no one can keep track of just one, right. and you get lost in the blizzard of snowflakes. D this is all going to come down on the kids. Yeah, it, it, it's, it might. It, You're right. Who does this to their children? You're right. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really a shocking thing. So the, the $400 million that Donald Trump apparently owes in the next three years, is that personally guaranteed by, by Donald Trump, the individual? Or did, did, did the Trump organization get that money? Who, who actually received that money and who guaranteed it? Because was, was it Donald Trump individual or Donald Trump as one of the owners of the Trump organization? This, this is the thing that um, I know the president dreaded the most. He had to sign personally for this debt. Wow. Now, the money was used to buoy the organization's properties and to avoid a fire sale of bankruptcy. So he guaranteed this. And, and this is very different from the early 1990s when he was nearly a billion dollars in the hole, but none of it bore his personal guarantee. He was able to be too big to fail. And he used to brag about him, how he was the first guy who was too big to fail. And the banks and other lenders learned their lesson. They were never going to let him get this far into them without a personal guarantee. So what would be on the hook is all of his personal properties, the airplanes, anything that may be of value could be pledged as collateral because um, he promised it. But also as a member of the Trump organization, and I don't know exactly what his equity, you know, what his, what his equity stake is, but he could also pledge Trump organization property as well. Well, I think all of that has already been pledged. Yeah. They wouldn't, they wouldn't requ require his personal guarantee if these properties were had enough value in them that they could carry the debt. Now, there is value left, of course, but all of that fluctuates with the market. And one of the issues that Michael Cohen pointed out was that Donald Trump would inflate the value of his properties when it came to applying for loans mm -hmm. and deflate the value when it came to paying taxes. People play a little games with this and rarely get caught. But in the case of a property of owner like Trump, if you do it at the scale at which I think he's done it, yeah, you run into real criminal liability. I agree. If you're just joining us again, he's Michael D'Antonio, uh, does a great job as a CNN contributor in his upcoming book. Again, High Crimes, The Corruption, Impunity, and Impeachment of Donald Trump is out October 20th. Okay, that leads me to the next question, Michael, which is very important. Let's just say, hypothetically speaking, that he wins in November and he's in office for another four years. We're learning that he owes an upwards of $400 million. Isn't that a national security threat? Am I wrong in thinking that? Well, it certainly raises lots of questions. What is he willing to do in order to satisfy that debt? Now, he can refinance, and this is why the presidency has great value to him. He may wind up saying, well, look, going forward, whatever happens to me, Trump hotels bear the name of a president, and that's going to make them valuable worldwide. We could expand. We could franchise in places that you've never even considered. Wow. So he could actually, I think, thrive financially, maybe refinance this debt. And, and that's something that people really should understand. Having this amount come due is an issue, but it's only an issue if you can't roll it over. And it, it helps when people think about this, to think about how they handle their own mortgages. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. people will 
remortgage a property and and extend the term and take cash out, and it works out just fine Mm -hmm. because that property holds its value. The problem when it's billions of dollars worth of real estate is that you could hit a 2007-2008 crisis and the portfolio could collapse. Many of these loans have written into them provisions Mm -hmm. for calling the loans early in exigent circumstances, and all of Trump's properties could wind up in somebody else's hands. Michael, knowing what you know about Donald Trump and covering him over the years, what do you think happens if on election night he loses? Well, he's already poised to sue in every single state. So if there's a, a sign that... You know, maybe he lost by 10,000 votes in Florida. Maybe it's 5,000 in another state. Excuse me. Perhaps he could go into court in enough states and argue that there was some discrepancy in the way the ballots were counted, uh, freeze the counting of the ballots, uh, prevent a total from being reported officially, and tie things up. Now, this is why the Supreme Court nominee is so important to him. I think that he's hoping that he gets Amy Coney Barrett on the court before the election, that she would be seated when these suits get to the Supreme Court, and that improves his odds of prevailing there. Uh, Think about how corrupt that is. You know, we used to look at other countries and see rubber stamp Supreme Courts that would do whatever the dictator said he wanted them to do Mm -hmm. and say, well, thank goodness we have an independent judiciary that doesn't play politics, yeah. that, that only follows the law. So much for that. Well, you know, he may get a surprise. I'm not sure that these justices are as um, committed to him politically as he hopes. I don't think everybody is as corrupt as Donald Trump believes. I could see uh, the new justice saying, look, I I came in under strange circumstances, but I have integrity. I'm going to do what's right. Right. Justice Roberts has done that a few times and surprised people. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, that's true. That's a good point. I I think that we can't yet give up on the court. You you might give up on certain issues that they've all expressed themselves on as matters of law. Right. But but to say that political party or um, conservative leanings suggest they will subvert an election, that's a, that's yeah. a big step, but I'm, I'm not sure they'll do it. You know, I, I, and I, I want to talk a little bit about your book, but since we're, we're on the subject maybe of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, I mean, the moment, there's so many weird moments in the last three and a half years, I'm sure you would agree, Michael, with the president, particularly the Bible that he held upside down in, in Washington, that was one of the moments, there's plenty of them, but how about the moment, Michael, when he's a few feet away from the casket of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and then you have a bunch of people booing him and saying, vote him out, I mean, this is unprecedented, listen, George George W. Bush, uh, Bill Clinton, you know, listen, we've had presidents in the past that were very polarizing, but nothing like this. What do you make of that moment as Donald Trump is is a few feet away from Ruth Bader Ginsburg's casket and you have the booing and the shouting, vote him out. And then when he's asked about it, he said he didn't hear it. I mean, what what do you make of that? Well, I I tell you, if I had been there and I had been one of the justices' clerks, I would have encourage people to shut the heck up. Yeah, yeah. You know, that was an affront to her memory. I agree. I agree and, with you. And, yep. and it, it, it uh, spoiled the dignity of that occasion. I think, you know, he was there in the role of the office. He I agree. He wasn't there as Donald Trump, mm-hmm. a crazy politician who's made everybody nuts. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I, I agree. But I think that it does show that he's made everybody nuts. You know, on that weekend, last weekend, there were people who were shouting at CNN's cameras in front of the Supreme Court so that their analyst, who's not a political reporter at all, could explain what goes on with the replacement of a justice. Mm -hmm. I, I, sure, you can be enthusiastic about a nominee, but what has happened to us? That yeah. people are not allowed to pay their respects in peace. They're not allowed to uh, do their job as journalists in peace. That right. You show up at these events and people are spitting on reporters. I mean, it it's is awful. 
You know, out of control. We are and we are we are as divided politically as we've ever been I'm, uh, since I've been alive. I'm I'm 40 years old. Racially, political divide. It's 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 crazy. I agree. So, Michael, before we let you go, and I appreciate your time, I want to give you an opportunity to talk about your upcoming book, High Crimes: The Corruption, Impunity, and Impeachment of Donald Trump, which happens to be coming out October 20th. Tell us a little bit about it. Well, it's the first real history of what happened in Trump's impeachment, and we actually did reporting in Ukraine, we did reporting in D.C. and New York City, and everywhere that Lev and Igor went to try and do in Ambassador Yovanovitch, we followed them. We've got the story of wow. Rudy Giuliani and the Three Amigos, what happened inside the White House. We even know what the whistleblower did to keep his activities secret hmm. before it all became public before the House committees. So. There's, it's a very complete account of the Ukraine scandal, how it came to pass, and how Trump wound up being impeached. And no one expected him to be found guilty in the Senate. That was a predetermined outcome. And the ultimate irony in all of this is Trump was in the clear. The day before he picked up the phone and called Zelensky to try and get him to help him politically, the Mueller report had been exhausted. The opportunity for the Democrats to impeach him on that basis had disappeared. And the guy is so impetuous, he's so impervious to reason, that he said, well, I, now that I'm free of that, I'll press my case a little bit more. Let's see if I can get the Ukrainians to destroy Biden hmm. and rewrite the history of 2016. It's a very readable narrative. I think anyone who's forgotten all of that story is going to be appalled by what they see in our in our book. Well, Michael, I really look forward to reading it. Again, it's out October 20th, and after I do read it, we'd love to have you back on again to talk about it uh, perhaps uh, around election time. You do a great job on CNN, and I certainly appreciate your time coming on our show and answering these questions. Thank you, Michael, for coming on. I really do appreciate it. Thank you. My pleasure. Yeah, thanks right. a lot, Michael. There you go. That's uh, Michael D'Antonio.